the more foods we cut out, the harder it is to actually get the full range of nutrients that our bodies need. Maybe we're trading resolution of one symptom for increased risk of some other kind of health problem, right? And this is a problem that I started seeing back in you know, 2013, 2014, not just in the paleo community, but sort of the wellness community more broadly, is nutritional deficiencies caused by restriction. And even when that initial restriction is medically necessary, I think the psychology is it drives us to restrict more foods. Now we're restricting foods that are no longer medically necessary and that it's harming our health because we're cutting out valuable food sources of, of nutrients. If you're on a restrictive diet to improve your health, there are some strings that come attached and this comes via nutrient deficiencies or the potential of missing out on key nutrients in your diet, whether it's a low carb or low histamine or low FODMAP diet. This is why I think the work that Dr. Sarah Ballantyne is doing and discussed today on the show is so crucially important. The one thing amongst a very fruitful conversation I wanna point you to is the resources she has for if someone is on a given diet, let's say low carb, what common nutrient insufficiencies can occur on that diet. And therefore, using her list of top foods to consume that will supply those nutrients. This is something that I feel is of crucial importance. Again, because we get so much information on what to cut out of the diet, but not enough on what to include. And perhaps more practically, if you do notice that you do better, let's say skew toward low FODMAP or low histamine, what risks of nutrient deficiencies does that diet pose? And how can you eat those foods or, or, or cue in on certain foods that you might run the risk of being deficient in. Sarah is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we have a very similar perspective on being evidence-guided and practical. And her book that we discussed today is called Nutrivore, about how to create a diet plan that focuses on nutrient density. And I think you will find this conversation incredibly helpful if you're struggling with how to eat, what to eat, and how to make sure you have adequate nutrition, which is going to be a foundation for long-term health. So with that, we'll now go to the interview with Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Like I was saying before, I'm so excited that you're here. You've written this wonderful book, Nutrivore, all about how we can optimize nutrient density in our diet. And I was explaining off air just uh, a moment ago how it's so easy for someone like me maybe to inadvertently mislead someone into thinking they've got to be on low FODMAP or gluten-free or low carb forever, even though I try to do a very diligent job of, of always painting that as a short-term rehab plan avoidance. And eventually you go back to broader activity or, or broader foods. But nevertheless, we don't talk about this a lot in terms of looking at diet as opportunities to eat your way into nutrients rather than things to avoid, 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 avoid. And eventually you lead or we get led to a point and you have some stats in your book. I think it's, you know, roughly 30% of people might find their way to an eating disorder. So this is a very timely, in my view, conversation. And again, thank you for the book. I'm excited to speak more about it. Uh, thank, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I feel like it's, as I said, saying off air, it's been, it's been too long and I always, I always love our conversation. So I'm excited. Why don't we start with a little bit about, because your background, you have a, a, a great background in research and, uh, you know, like in conventional medical research, you wrote a few, uh, very noteworthy books on the paleo diet. So what come, and I know the paleo community does a pretty good job, I think, about emphasizing the importance of nutrient density, but nevertheless, it is kind of an avoidance diet. So what led you yep. to write the Nutrivore diet book? Yeah, so back in 2015, I think-ish, give or take a year, um, I started working on a book about the gut microbiome um, that still mostly just lives on my uh, computer. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, in that research, um, you know, really working to understand the, this incredibly complex system and how it interacts with our diet, with our hormone environment, with, um, and like through our hormone environment, uh, with our lifestyle factors, 
I kept getting faced with papers that were showing me the immense health value of foods that I was not eating, foods that I was afraid of Mm. uh, because the paleo diet taught me to be afraid of them. Right. And uh, there, there, at one point, there's not, not like a eureka moment, like I wasn't Bernoulli running through the, the streets of eureka, Rome naked yeah. going, aha, I've got <laughs> it. Um, but uh, so there was no, not like one uh, sort of epiphany moment, um, but rather like a years long uh, process of reevaluating a lot of the things about nutrition that I had up until that point held to be true. First, viewing them through the lens of the gut microbiome, and then taking a a much more like thirty thousand foot view of looking at things like all cause mortality, um, and uh, I think you know I, I it started with lentils being the okay well I'm afraid of lentils and look at how fantastic lentils are for um, you know feeding probiotic strains of bacteria in our guts. Um, and then I added lentils back into my diet after, you know, reading a, a certain amount of research where I was like, no, I'm, okay, I, I'm avoiding these uh, in a way that's maybe to my detriment. Um, and then it was chickpeas, and then it was oats, and then it was corn. And over time, I realized that um, I had expanded my diet beyond what uh, the paleo template is, um, but that I also couldn't stand behind those recommendations. And so I started uh, in 2019, I started talking about this process. Um, I was really talking about the science as I was still learning. So my transition out of the paleo community really took place uh, in public. Um, and by 2020, I was like, I, it's, it's time for me to rebrand, right? It's time for me to find something else that... Uh, a different term for me to identify with that better aligns with how I think about food now after having gone through these years and years of slowly, slowly, slowly opening up my eyes to I've, I'm wrong about some stuff and uh, and I need to I need to message that. Um, and so Nutrivor was a really natural term for me. Um, I, it was a word that I had already been using for for years as just a diet focused on nutrients. Um, But then as I began building the new website, Nutrivore.com, as I started writing the book, I think a lot of my own sort of like personal health journey is more reflected in the psychology of how I present Nutrivore. So I talk about Nutrivore as just being the goal of getting all of the nutrients our bodies need from the foods we eat. And that's something that you can apply to any diet, right? Uh, Understanding what types of foods have what types of nutrients and where we can tweak our food choices so that we're expanding uh, our nutrient intake. But also I think, you know, part of the experience for me of addressing food fears and expanding my diet was I realized that I had a learned eating disorder uh, and that I was dealing with a lot of orthorexic behaviors and a lot of um, phobia about food and that that wasn't serving me. That wasn't actually improving my health, right? It was it was doing me a disservice. And so I communicate Nutrivore, while it certainly, you know, it's a set of principles that can be applied to any diet, I actually communicate it more as an anti-diet um, and talk about, you know, obviously other than for medical reasons, which is a whole separate conversation, the harm of a restrictive mindset when it comes to to food. And that that really reflects sort of my own personal journey, both like realizing that I had I had bought into some nutrition misinformation, um, but also realizing that a restrictive approach to diet was um, hindering my ability to, uh, you know, achieve my personal optimal best health. And by the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. This really does help us reach more people who are trying to improve their health. So it, it is uh, quite deeply appreciated. And like we were discussing just before we started recording, I found a really helpful and apt analogy to be one of rehab. Because I think it, it it puts into a context that most people, they just intuitively understand it. That we know that multiple types of activity 
and exercise are optimal for health. So you don't just want to do steady state, low intensity cardio. You want to do some weight training and some cardio, maybe some VO2 max where you're really pushing it. And then maybe even to maintain fast twitch, some plyometrics and some flexibility, right? So you need a broad swath of different movements. People get that. If, if you explain to them, hey, look at this diet, like a rehab plan, you hurt your back. And so for a little while, we're not going to move certain ways. We're going to be kind of restrictive. We're going to have a methodical plan that you do that's kind of in the box with the goal of over time, function improves, form improves, and you gradually start expanding outward. And sure, you might find that there's an upper limit to some activities. Like maybe you can only do, as I recently learned, I can't do plyometrics seven days per week. I kind of rediscovered these recently and I went ham. And then ah, patellar tendon started not liking me. So it's okay, I'm going to pull back a little bit. So maybe some people will notice that there's an upper limit for lentils or, you know, for whatever it is. But it, you know, there, there's a big chasm between the rehab plan avoidance short term and where we should ultimately be going, which is using a couple observations from there, but the longer term objective is lots of different movement patterns and a broad swath of foods in the diet. Yeah, uh, you know, a couple of, of thoughts along those lines, which is first, there's a really compelling body of scientific literature supporting the idea that a diverse diet is the healthiest diet, right? That the more different foods we eat, the better our long-term health outcomes, and that it's one of the most important features of a healthy diet. And it, that does, a, I mean, in practice, that does a couple of things, right? So diversity of foods means a diversity of nutrients. So it reduces the likelihood of having a nutrient shortfall of something really important. And there have been studies where they've used dietary diversity as a proxy for diet quality, low dietary diversity equaling malnutrition, and high dietary diversity eating equaling higher intake of essential nutrients. The other thing, though, that a, high, a diverse diet accomplishes is it lowers the risk of overdoing any one particular food, right, or on one particular nutrient. Um, it reduces the risk of being exposed to too high levels of a pollutant or a contaminant or an additive or something that we're sensitive to. So it kind of achieves both of those extremes, like in, in both the avoiding the bad and also making sure we're getting more of the good. But that's not how most diets are framed, right? Most diets are not framed with this is rehab and the end goal is to get back to dietary diversity. They're framed very black and white, right? It's dichotomous. It's here's your yes foods, here's your no foods. Here's your good foods, here's your bad foods. And when we approach diet that way, right, when we approach it as restriction, I'm going to cut out this group of foods. And I would argue the vast majority of diets are described based on what you avoid, right? Starting with low fat in 60s and 70s, 80s, low carb in the 90s. Paleo was always no grains, no legumes, no dairy, right? Like that's, that's always how paleo has been described. Um, we've got this a collection of different options of diets based on what you avoid. I think there's a couple of things that happen there. So first, when you achieve some kind of initial success on a diet, and let's face it, that's typically measured by weight loss. That is how most of these or, diets are or sold. From a, or from a gut perspective, um, and because I just want to make sure to do this tie-in for our audience, there may be less mm -hmm. bloating. And you may say, I have less bloating, right. I have better mental clarity, and it's really easy to assume that that's going to need to be your forever diet. Yes, yes. Well, exactly. So- it's or it's um you know more regular bowel movements right like uh, reduced GI symptoms of whatever whatever stripe. When you have that initial success on a diet and you credit the foods that you cut out for that improvement, I think it's a very like human nature thing to go okay well now I want the next thing right now um you know I'm still I still want to I want to lose ten more pounds or I I gain some of that weight back or. Um, I'm, you know, still dealing with, um, too much, you know, acid reflux, right? Like I've got, I've got something unresolved. I want the next level of whatever my health goals are. Well, now I just need to cut out the next group of foods, right? It, it is, it is such a natural, like, like assumption to make. If you credit what you cut out for your success, then clearly the path to the next level of success is to cut out the next level of foods. And the problem with that is it wasn't the... Well, 
I mean, generally, it wasn't the foods you cut out, right? If you cut out foods that you were very sensitive to, that is that's definitely reducing that, it gets some credit. But the things that improved your health was what you ate instead, right? It is the fact that you uh, cut out, let's say, gluten because you're gluten sensitive. So definitely that was that was part of it. But then you ate a lot more vegetables, right? So that is the credit is the foods that you ate instead, not necessarily what you were reducing. And so we're missing we're missing the I expanded my diet. I ate more whole foods. I ate more fruits and vegetables. I ate more seafood. I ate more of all these nutritionally important foods. We're kind of not viewing the the thing that actually deserves the credit uh, in that way. But we're also digging a deeper hole, right? The more foods we cut out, the harder it is to actually get the full range of nutrients that our bodies need. Maybe we're trading resolution of one symptom for increased risk of some other kind of health problem, right? Or we're trading... Uh, you know, long-term health outcomes for short-term weight loss. We're, we're no longer giving our bodies the nutritional resources that it needs. And this is a problem that I started seeing back in, you know, 2013, 2014, uh, not just in the paleo community, but sort of the wellness community more broadly, is nutritional deficiencies caused by restriction and even when that initial restriction is medically necessary, I think the psychology is it drives us to restrict more foods, that now we're restricting foods that are no longer medically necessary, and that it's it's harming our health because we're cutting out valuable food sources of, of nutrients. And so that's why I like the, the shift that conversation from not what you cut out, but what you add, right? Not what you restrict, but what you permit like what what is the important nutritionally important foods that we can add to fill those nutritional gaps always respecting when restriction is medically necessary but the other the other piece of this and and this is maybe a little bit less relevant to the conversation of um you know healing from various um you know gi disorders but i think that uh, certainly my experience with restrictive dieting is there's a really negative psychological impact. So when you view a group of foods as bad, you view yourself as bad when you consume them, and you restrict them, that actually increases food fixation, obsession, it magnifies cravings, it increases our susceptibility to emotional eating, and it does increase our likelihood of developing disordered eating patterns and eventually eating disorders. And I think that's something that is very um, rampant and not, not yet not talked about in the wellness community, is there's a lot of disordered eating patterns that are being learned through restrictive dieting. And ultimately, for a lot of people, that drives yo-yo dieting, right? That drives on again, off again. And whether that on again, off again is a weight regain cycle or a, I was feeling a lot better because I had symptom resolution on this diet, but then I couldn't sustain it because I was adopting it with a restrictive mindset. And then I decided to eat all of these foods that I know cause my GI symptoms and I can't, I don't feel like I have control, right? I don't, I don't feel like I can cut these out again, right? It's that like, white knuckling your diet and then uh, falling off the proverbial diet wagon. That's the other challenge with restrictive diets is it has this psychological impact that makes it impossible to sustain. And I think that setting ourselves up to sustain healthy eating patterns is the most important thing we can do to support our health, right? So, you know, adopting uh, whatever the dietary structure is in such a way that it matches with our food preferences. We're enjoying the foods we're eating, that we have the time and energy to prepare these foods, that it doesn't blow our food budget out of the water, right? Those things are really important for maintaining overall healthy eating patterns. So that is all made impossible by, you know, even when the diet looks the same, framing the diet in terms of restriction versus in terms of the foods that we add. Sure. That, that different way of talking about it is so important. Agreed. And there's two thoughts that come to mind um, in terms of what I see in the clinic. One is false associations where, and I get it, when, when someone's not feeling well, it's the worst. When you can't sleep, when you can't think, when you have a poor mood, joint, I get it. So I'm fully on the side of the people suffering. That's why I've dedicated, I think we've both dedicated our lives to alleviating that. 
But that being said, I've seen in a lot of cases where people will say, oh, you know, I had too much histamine this week and so I was kind of foggy. And then the, the follow-up question will be, are you consistently noticing an association between histamine intake and brain fog or whatever it is? And you'd be surprised how often people will say, well, not really, but, but sometimes it does. And the way I look at that is your body's naturally, you know, until you have things fully sorted out, there's going to be some ups and downs. And even when you feel well, people, you know, totally normally healthy people have ups and downs in how they feel. But especially, but, but especially when, you know, you're in the throes of some thing clinically. So there's a natural oscillation. And what I've observed is a lot of times people are falsely attributing, you know, when they're on a downswing, oh, it must have been because I had garlic or I had histamine, which is why I try to be critical with, unless you've really noticed, you know, a repeatable connection between a food and how you feel, then it's probably not the food. And, and why that's so important is because people, understandably so, they want to use food to heal. Love it, right? But even way back in Healthy Good Healthy You, I said, don't force a dietary solution to what might not be a dietary problem. And that's where I think people, they might have some other thing at play. And if we address that thing, then their oscillations are going to get better and better and better and better to the point where those false dietary associations become irrelevant. But I just want to flag that because I'm, I'm seeing more and more of that as we're really trying to coach people at the clinic to, you know, not thinking that they have all of these negative food associations because, you know, you, you want to criticize them. And if you can't, again, repeatedly observe a negative from consumption, then it's probably not the food. I think we, we've we kind of, and this is sort of like 50, 60, 70 years of diet culture that have taught us to think about food as a simple solution, right? So all I need to do is, you know, cut out these foods and then I can have magic unicorn fairy dust and rainbows, right? Like it's, it's always, it's sort of presented as you know, cut out your seven foods so you can lose seven pounds in seven days, right? Like it's very, <laughs> yeah. uh, here's here's your, the next your, best seller, your yeah. very simple solution. And online, we're presented with food is falling into two buckets, right? Toxic and superfood, right? Like the thing that's actually the root of all of your problems and like the miracle thing that's really expensive probably uh, that the affiliate commission is going to be earned on that we need to eat more of. And so I think because we we have been so programmed to think of food this way, um, we view it as like the easy answer, right? We view it as, oh, I felt crummy. It must have been that thing that I like, think of as a bad food, right? Think of as a, a thing that I shouldn't eat that I did eat, right? And part of that is the moralization of foods and ourselves when we eat it. If we view a food as bad, then we're bad when we eat that food. Or I'm going to judge you. I must assume you are bad, right? Because you have bad health, so you must be eating bad foods, right? We kind of also use it to propel healthism. But I think that the that it feels, even though it's not an easier answer, right? It feels like an easier thing than maybe the problem is not getting enough sleep. Man, going to bed an hour earlier is a way harder sell than any diet change possibly can be. Um, maybe it's unmanaged stress. Uh, making time for resilience activities like mindful practice, mindfulness practice, that's a way harder sell than anything to do with food. So I think part of it is we've 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 just been taught to think of food as this like really simplistic solution. Um, and part of it is we want food to, we want food to be the answer. We, we want it to be that easy. We don't want it to be a something that's harder to do. We don't want it to be, uh, you know, another vice, right? That we don't want to give up, or a big lifestyle change. And we still want it to be within our control. We also don't want it to be. This is this is the way your body is. Sure. Um. Right. Like we also want to feel like we've we've got some kind of something that we can do. So I, I think again, it it's partly. Partly how we've all just been programmed from diet culture, um, and partly like human human nature, right? We we want it we want it to be simple, and we want it to be within our power. Yeah, and I think especially at current because there's so many diet plans out there. There's so many differing opinions. So if someone can have a simple 
uh, like a like a confident thought leader who can just say do this, then it's easy to rally behind that because it kind of gives you the ability to put on blinders and say, well, I'm just gonna get on maybe like the carnivore train would be a good example. And I do think there's a lot of utility, especially for people with very sensitive digestion, of a rehab plan carnivore diet. But then representing it as a cure-all or what you do forever, I think is really malinformed. And, and um, I really appreciate what Chris, uh, Chris Kresser had said about this recently, which you know, no hunter-gatherer society purposefully ate carnivore. In fact, I don't think any hunter-gatherer society purposefully ate a very restrictive diet. They were kind of eating whatever they could get their hands on. And it was usually somewhat seasonal. There was a lot of, um, a degree of variety. I mean, it depends on where you live um, in terms of north-south um, latitudes. But yeah, so I, I get it on the one hand, but this is why I think if we can keep having this conversation about, let's focus on healthy foods to include in the diet, it's gonna give people uh, hopefully a not too complicated framework to follow. Um, and, and I guess, you know, maybe we can start putting a few foods on the board to, to go from like the philosophical to a few uh, specifics. And one of the things that I really, uh, was happy to see was you, you have this great section of your book called the Nutrivore score and you're giving a nutrient density score. And I'd love to unpack what comprises that score, but coffee was number one. And so the espresso lover in me was like, yay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, and then there's also liver, vegetables, and fish were some of the themes that I took away from what seems to be highly represented in this top 100 foods. But tell us about the score, and then let's let's unpack more about that. So um, this all started with uh, my need to quantify what it meant to be a nutrient-dense food. I think in the wellness community, uh, those of us who have been like nutrient density nerds for a long time have had this very like hand wavy explanation of what a nutrient dense food is. We basically look at a list of like percent daily values per serving and go, yeah, that feels nutrient dense, right? <laughs> it's all kind right. of like, it's all like that, oh, that, yeah, that impressed me. So that must be nutrient dense. Um, it's all very like gut instinct and not uh, not very scientific. Um, and actually, my initial intent when I was uh, doing the initial like uh, research and laying the groundwork for Nutrivore was to pick a nutrient density score from the scientific literature and use what I thought was the best option. I spent three months reading every nutrient profiling paper I could get my hands on, uh, which was most of them. And I found myself uh, quite frustrated with that field in general. So nutrient profiling is the science of categorizing foods according to the nutrients they contain. Right. And there's a couple of challenges that are happening right now in the research labs that are trying to develop different nutrient density scores, which is they're being very hamstrung by the USDA dietary guidelines for Americans. So there is this um, effort to figure out which nutrients to include and exactly like how to algorithmically include them in the math, right? So do you cap uh, the contribution at 100%? Do you normalize? Do you penalize for like sugars and salts and saturated fats and cholesterol, right? So there's a lot of like algorithmic conversation happening. And I, but Sarah, the, sorry to interrupt the, you, but I think that's really important because I remember way back when this was maybe paleo FX, gosh, like 2016 maybe, where Matthew Lalonde did a really comprehensive analysis of nutrient scores. And he, he was griping about his similar frustration where he felt that some of the, the inventories for the scores were skewed only for antioxidants or only for polyphenols yes. and they were leaving out certain yep. fat soluble vitamins as one example. So mm -hmm. I, I do think it's, it's really important that we have sort of a non-bias and, and scoring system. And some of that bias might come from our somewhat corrupted or captured nutritional system with influence and lobbyists trying to, you know, abide for whatever nutrients they care the most about. So I encountered the exact same challenge. Um, and the challenge exists in both the like academic uh, nutri nutrient uh, profiling methods as well as the uh, consumer, direct-to-consumer versions, which Nutrifor score is, right? A direct-to-consumer uh, nutrient profiling method. But like the Andy score, which used to be all over Whole Foods, if you recall, um, uh, doesn't include any of the nutrients that are uh, exclusively found in animal foods in its calculation. And it divides 
phytonutrients into about half of the nutrient categories. So they inflate the uh, score in the end. Um, so I looked at that and I'm like, well, we're just putting the bias right in the math, right? We're just like the, that calculation has got so much bias in it. And what is happening with the academic uh, labs that are doing this is they are trying to retrofit a nutrient profiling method to the healthy eating index. So they're trying to do figure out the math so that it aligns with USDA Dietary Guidelines for Americans. My feeling on that is I want to understand the food and learn from that and then see if the dietary guidelines need adjusting, which, I mean, they are adjusted every five years. Like, this could inform the next big adjustment to them. And so um, so I felt very frustrated. I felt like there was no good option. And so I felt like I can see, right, I can see the, the, where, where the algorithm needs to be, um, which is, so the Nutrivore score algorithmically is the same as the Nutrient-Rich Food Index. So it's just a sum of daily values divided by energy density. So there's no normalization, there's no weighting, um, there's no capping, there's no penalizing. It's just does it, how much of this nutrient does it have, rel you know, putting in perspective of how much the body needs, which is why you calculate it as a percent daily value per calorie. Uh, end of story. But instead of nine or 15 nutrients going to that calculation where, you know, researchers are like trying to figure out which nine gives you the answer that aligns with healthy eating index, I use every nutrient in which I have enough data that it makes sense to include. So it's 33 nutrients that go into that calculation. So it is a very broad uh, and very comprehensive way of measuring nutrient density. So total nutrients per calorie is what that number tells us. There's no normalization. The math is the math. And it's been fascinating. It's actually, for me, been a really important uh, pathway to dietary expansion because it helps me see mathematically the nutritional value of foods that I was maybe avoiding unnecessarily. I was cautious as I reintroduced just in case, but like, uh, you know, the only the only food now that I like I know I for sure can't do is gluten. Everything else that I had been avoiding for 10, 12 years, I have reintroduced into my diet uh, for for like a noticeable improvement in how I feel day to day. And so that experience uh, was largely informed by the Nutrivore score. I think it's uh, it's a wonderful way to help get over that food fear when you can just see mathematically here is the tremendous nutritive value of this food. Love it. Absolutely love it. And um, you reminded me of Marty Kendall. Uh, did you come across any of his work in your research? He's not a formal researcher, but he had done an analysis based upon a bunch of people he was having do chronometer assays and mm. looking for yeah, what yeah. foods would kind of help get them to uh, the most nutrient-dense diet. Um, but you haven't come across his work in this? He's not no, academic, although I'm, so. right, I've I've done actually probably I've probably done some of the same exercises with chronometer. So uh, that that is I'm going to have to look up his work now. Um, and how do you feel about yeah, chronometer think, as as a tool? Do you think that's if someone were to do a week in chronometer and then I believe it runs a report that will give you kind of you know all the nutrients? I'm not sure if if there's a bias in the selection of nutrients that they include. How do you feel about chronometer? Um, so I haven't done so I. I um, I refer to this exercise as doing a, a nutrient temperature check. Um, so it's like I call it temperature gauge tracking, where you're just kind of like, how am I doing on average? I think there's a lot of value in that exercise. I haven't looked at their reports. Um, so I couldn't say if the reports themselves um, are really balanced. And I know that uh, Chronometer has the same challenge that we all have, which is there's a lot of foods, especially branded foods, for which there's very limited nutrition data. Um, and so that makes for a very like incomplete report. So if um, if someone is actually doing this exercise and they're logging all of their food, uh, I sort of encourage like look for um, look for entries, like like select the the thing that says like USDA food distribution system, like those usually have more complete nutrition data. There's sort of like a, there's a way to do this where you like pick the right bone broth and the right broccoli and the, like the right chicken breast so that you're getting the most complete nutrition data into uh, that uh, journal. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of like the nutrition targets, they're just using recommended dietary intakes, which is 
what I would use developing a similar app, right? Like that's uh, that's the best we have for now. Um, there's there's obviously you know lots of situations where people's nutritional requirements are probably higher, but there's not really good guidance for most nutrients on how much. Like I think. Um, you know, they, we could say if you're a smoker, you need about 35 more milligrams of vitamin C per day. But if you're stressed, you're also burning through vitamin C and we can't tell you exactly how much more vitamin C you need, right? Like we don't have, we have just these very narrow circumstances where we have it well-defined and most of the time there's not enough science to really put a number to it. So I think looking at recommended dietary intakes as a minimum is a great way to go. Um, and the thing I like about doing it doesn't necessarily have to be seven days. It could be three. But the reason why I like doing a multi-day um, journal activity like that is that we don't really have to hit the daily value of everything every day. We've got some capacity to store every nutrient, uh, smaller capacity for things like water-soluble vitamins, higher capacity for things like fat-soluble vitamins. Um, but seeing whether or not you're meeting it on average um, is, I think that's that's a that's a great exercise. And if there's something that you don't meet any of three days or seven days that you're doing that exercise, now find the best food sources of, of that nutrient and add those. I think it can be very instructive. I know food journaling is a triggering activity for a lot of people with histories of dis disordered eating. Um, but if it's not, um, yeah, I think it can be a very instructive exercise. Are there certain nutrients that you're noticing people are most likely to be deficient in? Not to kind of bring it back to a reductionistic frame, but just curious. Well, I mean, there's there's a variety of different studies that um, look at this statistically and say, you know, potassium is the most likely nutrient shortfall. 97.8% of Americans don't uh, hit the daily value of potassium. So statistically, if I, you know, if I was a if I was a betting man, uh, I would bet uh, you're you're not getting enough potassium. Random person I'm talking to, like that is statistically extremely likely. Um, uh, vitamin E is the next most likely nutrient shortfall at 96% of Americans not getting enough. Uh, and then folate, which is about 90% of Americans. Um, but different diets have different nutrient shortfalls built in. So if you follow a diet that has a name, uh, you have a different likelihood for different nutrient shortfalls. So if you're following like a low fat diet, it's all the fat soluble vitamins, right? Like, um, if you're following a low carb diet, it's all of the nutrients that we see in more like carb rich foods, right? So you're much more likely to be, uh, to not be getting enough folate because our best sources of folate are legumes, like those nutrient, right? Those you're not likely to get as much magnesium, right? Um, so depending on the dietary structure, you've kind of got a different collection of nutrients. Um, but I think some of the most interesting, potassium is really interesting because there are no super concentrated food sources of potassium. Mm. So it's more like a, it's, it doesn't really matter what diet you follow. It's hard. It's hard to get enough potassium. Um, vitamin E, our best food sources are nuts and seeds. Um, and those, you know, depending on what diet you follow, um, because they're energy dense, they're a food that a lot of people feel like they have to, to limit. Um, and yet, you know, really like the main fat soluble antioxidant, right? Like it's such an important, you know, nutrient to have in our systems. So, um, so yeah, I think the, I mean, the interesting thing is when you look at different popular diets, they all have seven, eight, 10, 15 different nutrients that they regularly fall short of. It doesn't mean that you automatically are not getting enough of that nutrient. It just means that the dietary structure makes it harder to hit the daily value of those those nutrients, um, and I, I that's you know why I'm creating the resources that I'm creating. It's about understanding what types of foods have what types of nutrients, so that you can look within the foods that you um, like and that align with your dietary preferences that you have access to, and go, okay, well, I know that I'm following this particular diet, so I'm probably not getting enough vitamin B12. Let me look at these vitamin B12 rich foods and figure out which one fits into my, or which three that I can rotate between that fit into my life. And now I'm going to like intentionally figure out how to add those. And I think that's the knowledge base that most of us don't have, right? Most of us don't know. I can't tell you how many, every time I talk about vitamin K online, every single time I have somebody go, there's a vitamin K. <laughs> like it, it's, Sad we, we don't know. We don't like, yeah. 
we don't we don't have a base knowledge about uh, what the different nutrients are and what they do and where they can be found in the food supply. Where uh, where does this information live regarding diet plans and their most common nutrient deficiencies? Because I feel like that's such a amazing resource. Looking through the lens of the people who are dealing with IBS or whatever it is, fungal overgrowth, and so. Best case scenario, they're only in the healing phase for three months. That's, I think, if you know the clinician and the and everything is just hit right out of the gate the right way. Uh, longer case scenario, if maybe not all the factors are addressed, and there are some cases that are more complex where there's a, maybe a chronic infection or perhaps environmental mold, and so it's a layered approach. And so it may be a little while, six, nine, maybe even 12 months before the person feels resilient enough to start expanding their diet. So I think giving them those those cues like, okay, we've discovered with this person fungal overgrowth is a clear theme. So we're having them go low carb, um, at least for now. But that now, again, might be six, nine, 12 months. That food list of just make sure you include whatever from this fat, or I guess it would be um, like, <laughs> excuse me, like starch centric yeah. vitamins. Uh, incorporate those as best you can. I, mean, I think that's an amazing resource. Is, is that living somewhere? Because I want to selfishly yes. grab that and direct people to that. Um, so I have, uh, in chapter one of my book, I have a list of all of the most common uh, nutrient shortfalls for all of the nutrients. I also have an article in my Nutrivore 101 series on my website. Um, and those are amalgamated from a variety of different scientific studies. So uh, I'm taking as much uh, peer-reviewed scientific research data going into that. Um, I have for a long time wanted to do my own kind of study where I analyze um, common meal plans for different diets for their, their nutrient intake. Um, it, but it's a it sounds like such a simple idea, but it's actually a surprisingly complex mathematical uh, challenge. So it's not something I've had the opportunity to do yet. Um, but yeah, those those lists exist both in my book and on my website. And in terms of then like finding the food sources of those nutrients, so on Nutrivore.com, there's 60-something uh, in-depth articles about nutrients. So all of the essential nutrients are there, and then, because there's 49 essential nutrients, and then a bunch of additional important nutrients, even if they're technically not essential, are there. Um, and every single article has a section at the bottom which has best food sources and good food sources. So a best food source would be something with 50% or more daily value per serving, and a good food would be between 10 and 50% daily value per serving. And then you can click on those foods and see the full nutrient breakdown of those foods. Um, but I also have an ebook that's like top 25 foods for every nutrient. So 42 nutrients. So everything I've got good data for, um, and it lists the best food sources. So, um, so I, that's like, that to me is the most important information I can provide. And the information that is so hard to find on the internet. I, like, I can't tell you how many times I have decided, I have like had an idea of something to add to my Nutrifor website, and then I go to look for it, and it doesn't exist yet. Um, how I, I can't even the, my so I have a section on my website for daily values for different demographic groups, and that was in an insane amount of work to amalgamate from different sources. The the just the recommended dietary intake if you are a female between the ages of 19 and 51, right? Like it's just the, the even just that, it was um, very, very hard to find that information in a like collated format. So a lot of the articles on Nutrivore.com are filling a educational gap that uh, I don't know why that gap exists on the internet, but it, it, it did. Uh, and I think it's such valuable information, right? That is that is the information we need to make those choices. I need to know, oh, I'm on this diet, I'm not getting enough, you know, vitamin B3, what are my best food sources of vitamin B3? It, I mean, it's the most straightforward. When you say it, it makes so much sense, yet I've not heard that until this conversation. So um, again, I'm glad you're doing I, what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. I think, uh, you know, that was sort of like my my disillusionment with, uh, I mean, the wellness community more more broadly is this focus on isolated compounds to be terrified of in a food, 
and that doesn't mean like there are certainly times where people have sensitivities, right? That's not to not to talk about that, but to talk about uh, this sort of like myopic view of if I've got animal um, studies or cell culture studies where they take this one, you know, chemical isolated from a food in a high dose and they show that it's, you know, increases inflammation in an animal model of colitis, oh my God, then that preach. must mean the whole food is bad for the whole yeah. me. Yep. It's, it's that, that is where most of the conversation is, is again, this sort of myopic way of looking at foods that doesn't actually represent the health effect of the whole food when humans uh, as complex biological organisms consume it and completely missing from the conversation is where are we getting our nutrients from? Um, but I would also say it's not in the dietary guidelines for Americans I mean, they also fall like if you follow the dietary guidelines for Americans perfectly, you're you're still going to fall short of choline, vitamin E, vitamin D, iron, uh, and there's one more that I'm blanking on right now. Like there's there's nutrient shortfalls are still part of that equation because this philosophy of understanding where my nutrients are coming from and my food choices is still not integrated into dietary guidelines either. So I think this is this is the future of nutrition, right? This is the most basic function of nutrition is getting the nutrients that we need. And I think we've got this challenge that diets are all so often simplified to one thing, right? Cut your calories, lower carb, lower fat, uh, you know, high protein, right? Like it, we've got this one, this one, like the, this one underlying sort of approach to choosing food, but there's 49 essential nutrients, right? We, we can't simplify. It doesn't mean that eating a, a nutrient focused diet has to be 49 times complexity, right? It, it doesn't, it's, it's still not hard because every food gives us multiple things. Like it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, uh, a nutrivore approach is like necessarily complex, but it does mean that whenever we simplify our food choices to I'm choosing low this or high this, it means we're sort of missing the forest for the trees because we're not right. focusing on where we're going to get everything else that's nutritionally important. Yeah. And let's uh, double click on protein because uh, there, there's a pretty interesting case that's kind of come into vogue of late that if we optimize protein, that can help with muscle wasting. And this is a hallmark of aging, reduced muscle yeah. mass, reduced grip strength. Maybe we could even include VO2 max as like a loose proxy to muscle mass. So I see that case. I also see the case that making sure we get an adequate protein is really important. There is a, a gentleman, uh, I'm going to totally blank on his name, but he he was interviewed uh, on the Peter Atia podcast. He kind of made the rounds a, a well-known protein researcher who had a perspective of, yeah, I mean, there, there's a case here, but it may not mean that everyone needs to be getting in one gram of protein per pound of body weight. That that might be a little bit extreme. Maybe for someone like me who trains really hard, and I, I just tend to gravitate toward higher protein intake intuitively. So, okay, you know, maybe you can make that case, but to say everyone everywhere all the time needs to have a gram of protein per pound of body weight, um, you know, that seems to not be a totally justifiable case. How do you feel about, and it's probably a, a much, you know, a lot of complicated analysis for a simpler answer of get in a decent amount of quality protein in a day from a variety of sources. And you're, and that was essentially what his comment was, which was, you know, you don't need a super high intake. The quality does matter. So vegetarian sources will need to be more diligent about intake because they're less bioavailable. But otherwise, um, it didn't seem like it was too complicated of, a, of an issue. But uh, what are your thoughts on protein? Yeah. So, um, so I agree that the recommended dietary allowance for protein is probably too low. Um, it is not sufficient to support maintaining lean mass through perimenopause and females lose an average of 10% of their muscle just in the perimenopausal period. And it's not sufficient to prevent sarcopenia in aging. So the loss of muscle mass as we age that increases risk of frailty and, you know, loss of function as we age, a you know, big, big challenge. Um, it probably, but one gram of protein per pound of body weight for most people is probably too much. Where I think it is appropriate is in people with higher energy demands. Um, but often that 
one gram of protein per pound body weight is kind of like trending on social media right now is also framed within the context of caloric restriction because it's very much about maintaining muscle mass through through weight loss. And that starts to exceed the accepted macronutrient distribution range of protein, which is 10 to 35% of our calories from protein. So if you're doing one gram of protein per pound body weight, even if you are 150 pounds, if you're also eating 1,700 calories a day, now you're above 35% calories from protein. Um, and the challenge with that, there's, there's a couple of challenges with that. So when you start to get into that higher protein intake, depending on the protein sources, it does seem to increase risk of cardiovascular disease, more so when that excess protein is coming from animal foods, less so when that excess protein is coming from plant foods. And whether that's directly related to the protein or the other nutrients that are coming in those foods, right? Is that because high animal protein also means high saturated fat? Like that that question really hasn't been answered yet. But the I think the bigger challenge is when we're so centered on protein, we're, we're displacing other nutritionally important foods with our protein foods. And especially when we start using protein bars, protein powders, right, these more refined protein sources, now we're not even getting the nutrients that are packaged up in protein foods. Key, key point. I think so, that's a really key point. And I fell into that for a little while where it was just so easy yeah. to make a shake. Um that, yeah, I was hitting my protein goals, but you're right. I, I don't know this for a fact because I didn't do the math, but I'm assuming I was probably under nutrient, uh, you know, intakes in, in some key nutrients. Well, and typically what happens, unless someone's very uh, following a plant-based diet and really focusing on the protein and not relying on protein powders very much, um, for most people, it's the like fiber containing foods that are traded. And I think part of that is protein, protein foods are filling and fibery, fibery foods are filling. And it's really hard to have enough appetite for both when you have high protein goals. And so I have seen a whole lot of comments on social media. That's not a scientific study. <laughs> this is just a, <laughs> just a vibe. Uh, so we can't, we can't call this a, a scientific quote, but a whole lot of comments of, yeah, I was trying to do that much protein and it wrecked my gut, right? I was trying to do that much protein and I had you know, all, the, all of these symptoms. I was so constipated or, you know, like I had the right. worst bloating ever when I ate that much protein. And I don't think it's the protein that's the problem. I think it's the protein displacing other, especially whole food sources of fiber. As, well, and as then on the other the side of the spectrum, you can make that argument for when people go too high fiber, they can have the same sort mm -hmm. of problem. So, you know, maybe <laughs> right? this is just coming the back The to fiber candy, the fiber wraps, the fiber, right? Like, for sure. There's so I, many fiber enriched. Yeah. So maybe again, yeah, it's just like I the think, truth is somewhere in the middle where it's not too much protein, not too much fiber, but yep. you know, shocker, like a reasonably balanced diet, which it's back in, defense, to in, in, in defense of our audience, that's been, I think, a more challenging thing to find data on to your earlier point. Yes, no, for sure. And I think, um, so I think the better protein goal for most people is between half and three quarters of a gram of protein per pound of body weight. That's where most of the science is. So most studies are 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. Um, so just rain, it's still more, it's still about double the recommended dietary allowance, um, but it's just reining it in a little bit. And uh, if we can rein that in a little bit, Again, if you're a very, very active person with a, a much higher energy requirement, you can have that one gram of protein per pound body weight and still be at 20% of your calories from protein, right? Like that is that is your exception. Um, but for, for most everyone, uh, reining in that protein a little bit, um, you know, we already, 95% of people fall short of the 14 grams of fiber per thousand calorie recommended dietary allowance for fiber. Um, I think that's a great start. But to your point, I think that the challenge with fiber is people go from zero to 100 in 0.6 seconds. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't go well. For sure. So we, we get very, very excited about, about fiber and, and we, we tend to overdo it. Um, and that can cause a variety of unpleasant symptoms. Our gut bacteria need time to adjust to, to increases in, in food, right? If you, if, I mean, if you overfeed a dog they get sick. It's kind of the same thing, right? With our gut bacteria, you're, if you if you dramatically increase your fiber intake, you're feeding them way too much food, they're producing way too much metabolic output, and that 
creates a nasty uh, bunch of, of, you know, shifts in that system. So, sure. uh, you know, a five, five gram increase per, once per week, right? Like go up or go up or every few days, per right? Week. Wait a few days, go up five grams. Uh, to up fiber intake, even if you're way below, right? So if, if you're even if you're way below the recommended dietary allowance for fiber, to get up to that thirty, you know, twenty eight grams, say for for women, thirty five grams for men, uh, as a as a general starting place, even getting up to that, you kind of want to ease into it. You don't really need to do that for for other nutrients, but for fiber, for sure. Uh, and I think that gives people, you know, when they get that. Uh, predictable GI effects from uh, going up too aggressively in in fiber intake. It makes people feel like, oh well, I can't eat that food, right? Oh, I yeah, beans and I don't get along. Absolutely. But maybe start with a little yep. bit and increase gradually over time, and maybe you do get along with beans. You just don't get along with all of the beans all of a sudden. Sure. No, and and that's been well documented with clinical trials giving either fiber supplements or prebiotic supplements that there's that adjustment period of maybe a week, maybe two, and that can be mitigated if it's a slow titration upward of the dose. Um, so one of the things that is very nutrient dense per your nutrivore score is liver. And this makes me think about a practice I feel to be very practical, very easy to do, which is not just eating flesh proteins, but now I'm a big fan of the ancestral blend um, I forget the name of the company. Oh, and by the way, that protein researcher, his name is Don Lehman uh, or, or Lyman. So um, I'm not sure if you're, so just for our audience, if you want to look up his work, I think he, because there, there's a few big names who are really pushing hard for very high protein intake. Don, I think, is kind of like the OG protein researcher, and he has a very nuanced and reasonable perspective that's in the middle, you know, between the one gram per pound body weight and maybe like you don't need protein at all. Protein will kill you. Animals are bad. Um, but so these liver blends where it'll be a combination of beef plus beef liver plus beef heart, kidney, and spleen maybe – now, for some, that may sound like, ugh, but it's actually not too bad. If you saute it on the stovetop at a medium-high heat, you get a little bit of caramelization, you use some salt, pepper, it can actually be delicious, and you can't even really taste the organ meats in there. Uh, so I'm assuming you're a fan of that sort of approach. Yeah, I love that approach. I think um, I, I – so I'm a big fan of – sneaking nutrition in, right? Yeah. And I think when we use those uh, organ meat, like grind meat, um, ground meat blends, we're, we're treating ourselves the same way we would our kids when we, you know, sneak a bunch of vegetables into a smoothie or, you know, into brownies, right? Right. right? We're kind of just treating ourselves the same way by sneaking in a bunch of extra nutrition that way. And the, the cool thing about liver is it really doesn't take much to make a huge nutritional impact. I mean, so much so, there's really only three foods that we actually have to be careful of how much we eat so that we don't hit chronic toxicity levels for nutrients. One of them is Brazil nuts. So 10 Brazil nuts a day will eventually lead to chronic selenium toxicity. You have to eat 10 or more every single day. Um, but that's no fun because your hair and fingernails fall out. And also you have garlic breath without the garlic. So chronic selenium toxicity, no fun. Um, there's a few varieties of seaweed, especially kelp, that have such high iodine content that you can hit iodine toxicity if you're eating kelp every single day. And liver can hit both the chronic toxicity levels for vitamin A um, at about two or three servings per day, but also for copper at about one serving per day. And one serving being four ounces measured raw, so about three ounces cooked. So um, so it's just one of those foods that we – like it's so nutrient-dense, we actually have to be a little bit careful not to overdo it. Um, and so just that like a couple of ounces per week can make a huge nutrient contribution. All, all of your vitamins, all of your minerals, right? Our, our livers um, store nutrients because uh, those nutrients are used in detoxification processes. So our livers, rather than being uh, a sponge for – toxins like heavy metals, they hold the nutrients that are required for all of those chemical reactions to make those toxins uh, inert so that they can be uh, expelled from the body. So uh, liver is by far the most nutrient-dense uh, um, animal food, 
with the exception of oysters, which are actually about the same. So if you hate liver, oysters have a very, very similar nutrient profile. Uh, so that's another great place to get all of the, the same great nutritive value. But yeah, those organ meat blends, there's a, there's a bunch of different companies um, that make them. I live relatively close to White Oak Pastures, uh, which has, has one. Um, and depending on the, the, the farm or the butcher or, you know, the company that's making them, um, they're anywhere between like 90% muscle meat, 10% organ meat to 50, 50. And that's just what, what's your flavor preference. I find those 90, 10 blends. I can't taste the organ meat at all. Like you can just, you can make burgers with that. Um, and if you do find yourself with a stronger flavored one, like make something with a lot of seasoning, right? Like make taco beef or something, right? That has a lot of seasoning to, to mask that flavor. But yeah, I think those are a fantastic strategy for upping nutrient intake with something you would already be eating, right? Sure. Like yeah. that's, that's the perfect scenario. It's the same experience and yet so much more nutrient. And knowing if it's 90, 10 or 50, 50 is something I need to check because I'll consume, gosh, maybe a, a one pound packet, maybe four to six times per week. So I might be getting a little bit high if it's 50, 50. I don't think it is because the taste is is nearly indistinguishable. Yeah. It's probably 90, 10, but that's a really important thing that I'm going to check on. When I um, make it myself, because this is also a thing that you can just do. So I um, my my home hack for this uh, is to buy frozen liver or freeze it if you buy it fresh and then let it uh, let it thaw for an hour in the fridge and then grate it on a box grater. And then I mix that with ground beef and I usually do 20%. So I'll do 20% liver and 80% uh, ground beef. Um, and that, uh, you know, provided it's not pork liver or something that's a really strong flavor, as long as like beef liver or chicken liver, um, it's it's not detectable to me. Like it just feels a little bit richer in flavor, but not necessarily. Like I feel like the really high liver ones have that metallic tang to them yeah. that can be off-putting for a lot of people. Uh -huh. And thoughts on the other organ meats? Uh, I'm assuming they also score fairly high, but um, yeah. yeah, so you, you think it's yes. going to include so all of them, not just liver? Yeah, so just about everything scores high. I think the only exception is marrow is so... Um, so energy dense that it doesn't have very high nutrient density. It still has valuable nutrition in it. Uh, it's still delicious. Like I'll still have marrow given the chance. Um, but that's the only one that's not like a really high nutrient density. What's really interesting is the nutrient profiles are different, right? So like heart has lower nutrient density than liver or kidneys, but it also has five times more coenzyme Q10. So, um, so you're, you know, even when you're maybe trading absolute nutrient density, that doesn't mean that you aren't still getting something nutritively valuable. And so it's a little bit of a, like a caution when we're talking about using the Nutrifor score to tweak food choices is um, it's really important to really only compare highly related foods, um, right? So kale and, and liver have about the same nutrient density, but I would not say that they're the same, like they're interchangeable in my diet, right? I'm getting very different nutrients per serving, and I'm getting just a very different collection of nutrients, right? There's 11 essential nutrients. I think liver has more than 50% or 60% daily value per serving, and there's only three for kale, right? Like, it's it's a very different um, nutritive contribution to my overall diet. So the Nutrifor score is a great lens through which to view food, but it should never be the only piece of information that we're using to inform food choices. We will also want to combine that with what types of nutrients am I getting? How does this contribute to my overall diet, right? Those yep. are other things that we want to be thinking about. And then using the oysters as sort of a, a case study on a food that some people might be avoiding, especially if they're canned oysters, mm -hmm. which I have found to be very easy to do. Canned yeah. oysters, I do them myself. They're actually delicious. And affordable. Yeah, and affordable. So histamine can be an issue for some people. We've talked a lot mm -hmm. on the podcast about this. But, you know, there's always this really important perspective of it does, and I say this like weekly in the clinic, it doesn't mean you can never have a high histamine food, you know, for, for audience. I know you know this, but so I find myself coaching people or, or kind of putting on my counselor's hat of, okay, at baseline, you're eating a lot of histamine and you reduce your histamine. We did sort of like the two week experiment and you feel better. Awesome. 
That does not mean you can never have avocado. You can never have any sort of canned food, but rather maybe you have two cans of oysters per week. And that sort of falls within what you're saying, which is it wouldn't be a every day or multiple times per day. And the same thing with kale, right? Any of these foods, someone can find someone commenting on, you know, kale is high in oxalate, so therefore you can't have, well, okay, you can't do kale multiple times per day every day, but maybe you do kale one day and then char another or, you know, and that, I think that variety is the real antidote or yeah, antidote to making sure people don't have too much of anything that might be a food trigger for them. So it almost seems like if we can get over this hump of getting to enough diversity, then we have a safeguard against eating too much of any one food component that can trigger someone. And I think that's a key concept for people to bear in mind. Because if you don't get over that cusp, then you might be relying too much on high histamine and you say, well, I tried to expand, but it didn't go well. And you may have been just shy of getting over that that little cusp there. Yeah, I agree completely. I think um, food sensitivities are often explained in very similar language to food allergies, right? So if you have an allergy to peanuts, there's not an amount of peanuts per week that you can eat, right? Like in in general, unless you're doing allergy shots or, or something else, right? Um, but with food intolerances, food sensitivities, there's typically a threshold, right? There's typically a, a cusp below which your body is able to process whatever that compound is and above which it's overwhelming those, those systems. And that threshold is different from person to person and sometimes different month to month, right? Like, um, uh, I ha have re reintroduced tomatoes a few years ago, um, but tomatoes 10 years ago caused me joint pain. Uh, and I think that's, a, you know, potentially it was a stress response and it, it wasn't a real food intolerance. Uh, or potentially I recovered from that intolerance with the high quality diet and all the great lifestyle choices I was making. And I'll never know because I'm not going to be able to go back and redo that experiment. Um, but, you know, these, these are our threshold level will change generally over time. Um, and so, if we can change the language around food intolerances, right, around FODMAPs, for example, um, or histamine, and sort of say, okay, it's all about understanding threshold. And maybe maybe it's like you can't eat the whole can at once. Um, but also with histamine, it's always so challenging, right? Because one brand might have real, much higher histamine than another brand just because of you know, how, how quickly those oysters were put on ice after they were harvested, right? How, how, how much, you know, histidine was actually uh, converted into histamine. So um, maybe it's, I can eat a whole can of this brand, but only half a can of this brand. And it's, you know, one of those things, it's why it's so helpful to have food and symptom journals to be able to really like, you know, self-experiment, but do it methodically, like figure out what is, what is the, the thing that works for me. Yeah. And, you know, histamine, it's, it's funny that you mentioned um, histamine and, and tomatoes because I've noticed under times of stress, I've got to pull back on histamine. For uh, quite a while, I was making a lot of headway, expanding my diet. And I was probably having a fermented food at almost every meal, which historically would have wrecked me and was doing very well on that for a year plus. And then there was a SHIT storm of stress. And I started noticing those histamine symptoms coming back. And mainly for me, that will manifest as a little bit of irritability during the day and also a problem falling asleep. So I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to do, I was doing like two different sorts of krauts, like a sauerkraut and a beet kraut with every yeah. meal plus lemon juice, mm, yum. Uh, which was great, right? But I had to pull back for a little while and kind of revisit what I hope people will make a note about, which is what is kind of like your rehab diet and when you're weathering a storm, you may have to revisit that for a little bit and then go back outward, right? It's almost like if we use the ship analogy, it's probably a crude and corny analogy, but if there's a storm, you pull down your sails, right? And then once a storm passes, you put your sails back up. So we can maybe think about it in that context of when there's a storm, you pull back a little bit with your diet. And then as those waters get more calm, you can start expanding again. Part of it too is... Um our nutritional requirements increase when we're under stress, right? So we burn through vitamin C, we burn through magnesium, 
uh, we're probably using up more zinc, more omega threes, right? There, there's nutrients that are used up in that stress response. And vitamin C is fascinating because it's it's not only sort of used up in the stress response, but it's also a cofactor for a, a bunch of neurotransmitters and uh, cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline. But it also modulates um, the adrenaline receptors. So it is really important for how our body is responding to stress hormones as well. So it modulates not just the production of stress hormones, but the activity of the rest of the body in response to those stress hormones. And so, you know, it's another like plug for nutrient dense foods um, and a sort of nutrivore approach is when we're sick or stressed or not getting enough sleep, like we do, we actually need more nutrition in those situations. I can't put an exact number to it because there's just not enough science to say 10% more, 25% more, or 10% of this, 25% of this. Like I, I, I don't have enough science to be able to say exactly this much. Um, but that's where that, you know, like batten down the hatches, uh, but also what, what are the nutrients that I can get even more of now that can help support these systems in and this pulling out your time. guide, right? This is where I could see pulling out that guide of, okay, I'm going to go low carb or low histamine, whatever it is. What nutrients am I likely to be deficient in? And I can make sure to find a way to get those into my diet with other foods that are like yeah. non-high carb, non-high histamine. How much do you think the food supply is exacerbating this problem? Um, to ask a really simple question, yeah. <laughs> uh, it feels like, let's open a whole can of worms right. as we're wrapping up. Um, so the more processed a food is on average, the more nutrients are stripped out of it. And um, there are studies that show that the more ultra processed foods a person consumes, the lower their intake of fiber, vitamin B3, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, vitamin C, D, E, uh, calcium, zinc, and magnesium, right? So we've got this like collection of nutrients that, and these are just the ones that have been measured. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much lower someone's, you know, coenzyme Q10 is or polyphenol content is when they're eating a lot of um, ultra processed foods because this hasn't actually been measured in studies yet. Um, and so, you know, certainly uh, the more whole foods are displaced from the diet on average, the lower the essential nutrient intake. But there are a lot of ultra processed foods that are still really nutrient dense. And I think it's why we kind of need to think about food choice in a little bit more sophisticated way than just the processing, um, because there is sort of this wide collection of, I mean, if you think about foods that are technically ultra processed, it includes things like uh, canned soups and frozen dinners. Um, it includes fruit on the bottom yogurt and instant oatmeal, like foods that uh, are potentially really nutritionally valuable foods. So I definitely think that um, the modern food supply, you know, one of the challenges is that ultra processed foods are about half the cost of their whole food counterparts, right? They're, they're cheaper, um, they're less satiating, they're uh, addictively delicious, and generally have fewer nutrients. So I think that there's a challenge there, but I also think we don't necessarily need to completely rehab the food supply in order to shift eating patterns towards ones that's more nutrient focused. I think there's a way of understanding which ultra processed foods offer a lot of nutrition and then like what are the most important whole foods to like make sure we're filling all of those gaps. So, um, you know, I definitely think that it's, uh, it makes things a little bit harder than if whole foods were the cheap ones. I think if whole foods were the cheap foods, we'd have a very different uh, right. health landscape. And I didn't realize that, is it correct to say that canned foods are considered ultra processed or is it not that, I'm assuming the contents in it, the can are probably the more important Yeah, factor. it depends on the ingredients list. So like a canned uh, oyster, a lot of right? So, I mean, that's not ultra processed. Yeah, so it depends on the, well, what's interesting is, so the NOVA classification is the the main system used to determine whether a food is whole, a, a processed culinary ingredient, a processed food, or an ultra-processed food. So some canned foods fit in processed foods and some fit in ultra-processed. And you could have like a can of black beans that because of the ingredients fits in the processed food, NOVA class three, and the can of black beans right beside it that because of the ingredients it has slightly more additives falls into the ultra processed foods. So it's not actually an easy system for people to navigate, but also I would argue um, maybe that's not the right skill 
right? Because the level of processing, while on average it reduces the nutrients, it doesn't, if you go food by food, it doesn't necessarily, right? So that canned black beans that has 2% additives versus the can of black beans that has 1% additives, overall nutritionally, they're nearly identical. Yeah. So in terms of like what black beans you're going to get, you don't need to worry about which one's ultra processed versus which one's a processed. Um, get the ones that make sense that you like, right? That's cheap on sale, whatever. Um, so I think that's why, you know, there's a lot of it's, I think it's a really nuanced conversation to have around ultra processed foods because I think we're we're trying to as a as a society right now we're trying to it's our it's our new boogeyman right mm. it's our new it's our new thing to to blame um, and I think that that conversation is sort of necessarily very nuanced. Well, maybe we can do a part two because one of the things yeah, that we're, we're definitely not going to have enough time, but I had a list of contentious foods I wanted to drill into: gluten, grains, dairy vegetable oils, frozen, canned animal foods, seafood sourcing. Um, so I'll, I'll plant that as maybe a part two, because I think just a whole yeah. conversation dedicated to that would be super I, I feel super like, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I potentially have some fairly controversial views uh, about those foods, um, but controversial because there's a lot of fear on the internet that doesn't align with where the scientific totally, evidence totally, is. Totally agree. Um, but I also think, you know, my mission um, is to help people improve their diet quality, period. And I think that improving diet quality does not have to mean not liking a food, right? It doesn't have to mean that food is bland and boring. Uh, it doesn't have to mean that we miss our favorite foods. And it doesn't have to mean that those foods are expensive. So, so part of the educational resources that I'm creating is also busting myths about foods that are making people afraid of affordable nutrient dense options. Sure. Um, it's sort of kind of counter to where, uh, where most, uh, wellness influencers, uh, uh, their trajectory. Yeah. Well, that's just a problem. It's, it's the influencer in the wellness influencer that I think is a problem because extremism and, and really simplified, strong, clear messaging tends to do well because it's easier, right? It's, yes. And I've said this so many times on the podcast. I'm sorry for our audience. This is just ridiculously trite of me to say, but the people who will tell you that, you know, plants are going to kill you and you've got to do it. It's much easier to say, oh, well, this person is so confident. They must have it mm -hmm. all figured out. Um, but that's why I think conversations like this are just so, so crucial. Uh, one quick thing before we come to a close, your framework seems so practical. It's essentially 50% vegetables and fruit of the plate and then 25 for starches and 25 for protein. And I would think that that framework where then people look for the most nutrient dense from each category and do their best to populate with what they know they tolerate. And maybe if they're a little bit skewed toward lower carb or lower histamine or lower FODMAP, they can consult one of your guides to look for the most nutrient dense foods that they want to consider based upon the fact that that given dietary plan may lead to certain deficiencies. This seems like a really practical way to give people guidance so that they can just have some, I guess, assurances and solace that they're not going to be eating their way into a nutrient deficiency. What's even more powerful about that simple formula is I've done a ton of math uh, in all of the development of my resources. And just following that formula and aiming for some dietary diversity, for most people, we'll get them 90% of the way to their dietary requirements of essential nutrients. Um, you know, then then there's like, we can refine, right, to get that extra 10%. Sure. But for most people, like, that's that's it, right? That's all we need to do is, is craft the majority of our meals with that simple formula. We can get, and I've got lots of resources to get even more into the weeds and get more nitty gritty for the people who like, want to super optimize. Um, but I think that one of the most liberating things is that even though we're told, like this is a constant message online, that it's so hard to to meet our nutritional needs, like that's why you need to buy whatever supplement is being sold, it actually isn't. Um, you know, with the resources that I've created, um, the Nutrifor Meal Map, the Nutrifor Weekly Serving Matrix, you can hit 100% of the daily value of all of your essential nutrients with, depending on your energy requirements, 50 to 75% of your calories without having to buy expensive foods. And that leaves a lot of room for rounding out with quality of life foods, right? Food, not every food we eat has to contribute to the mission of meeting our nutritional needs. Yeah. Some foods can just be tasty. And that I think is one of the most liberating things about looking at the quality of the whole diet versus is this a good food or a bad food is it really shows that 
you can fit any food into a healthy eating pattern, right? If, you're, if your diet meets your nutritional needs, it's okay if one of the foods you ate was a donut. Yep. Because uh, everything else made up the difference. Sure. No, I mean, this is a message I think that needs to really be propagated. So uh, again, just really appreciate everything. And uh, the book again is Nutrivore. People can buy this pretty much everywhere, anywhere. Anywhere and, and, books are sold. And uh, where else would you point people online to follow you? Uh, come hang out on my website, Nutrivore.com. That's where you can find all of your articles about nutrients and all of the foods that contain them. Uh, if you click on the join button in the top right corner, that's where you can find the uh, form to join my free weekly newsletter, which is more bite-sized information if long academic articles on my website are too much. Um, <laughs> and I am at Dr. Sarah Ballantyne on Instagram, Facebook, Threads, TikTok, YouTube, and Pinterest. And I post on all of those platforms every single day. So wherever you like to hang out online, come join me. Love it. Sarah, been a phenomenal conversation. Let's do a part two really soon. Yeah. I would love to.